The Audio Beacon, June 2022 The Queen's Platinum Jubilee Thoughts on the Jubilee by Jenny Vesey June 2022 As I type that document name, some two weeks before you will be reading this, I find myself thinking, so what on earth can I write about June 2022 that won't be said hundreds of times in hundreds of different articles by hundreds of people, and probably, in many cases, far better than I am likely to put it? I'm sure I shan't find anything new to say about it, and yet it feels impossible to produce a ministry team letter for June 2022 without focusing on it. It, well, obviously, the Platinum Jubilee. It is such an extraordinary event, in a time when we're becoming accustomed to extraordinary events, and a time also when records in every area seem regularly to be broken. But, 70 years, doing one job, and that not even a job of choice. When Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II ascended the throne, there were not as many career options available to young women as there are now. There were options open for ordinary women, but not for the young Elizabeth. The job she inherited, unchosen, encompasses many different formal roles, including that of Head of the Church of England, thanks to Henry VIII's standoff with the Catholic Church. Prayers for the monarch from the Book of Common Prayer 1662, one of the eventual outcomes of the split from Catholicism, ask that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way, and study to preserve thy people committed to her charge in wealth, peace and godliness. If you look at a coin in your purse or pocket, unless you have gone entirely plastic or digital, you'll see the letters FD or fid def, stamped around the edge of the obverse, the side we call heads when tossing a coin because it shows the head of the reigning monarch at the time of minting. Those letters stand for fide defensor and form part of the full Latin inscription Elizabeth II de gratia regina fide defender. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen Defender of the faith. The faith, of course, being Christianity. So, these comprise a job description of sorts, I suppose. Interestingly, ironically perhaps, the title Defender of the Faith was bestowed on Henry VIII by Pope Leo X in 1521, before the English Church split from Roman Catholicism and Henry, ever the opportunist, hung on to it in his new role as head of a new national church. Our current Queen, in fact, elaborated on this aspect of the job in a speech at Lambeth Palace on the occasion of the last Jubilee in 2012. The role of our established church is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions, Instead, the Church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. Gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other communities and indeed people of no faith to live freely. Woven into the fabric of this country, the Church has helped to build a better society. Your Majesty, Ma'am, I hope, I do hope, that in June 2022, that is all still true for all of us. Jenny. The Jubilee Around the Benefice. The Queen's Jubilee in Inkpen by Gerald Atkinson. It was quite a weekend. After the lighting of the beacon on Warbury Hill on Thursday, we had our big Jubilee Saturday, starting with the village fete on the playing field in the afternoon and continuing with the party in the park in the evening. You'll remember that despite the weather forecasts, the day was a beauty. The turnout was great and both events were much enjoyed by all. On Sunday morning, a congregation approaching 40 came to our tribute to the Queen in the church. Central to this was the Queen's Christian faith 
and in extract from her Christmas messages, we heard, in her own words, how this has both inspired and guided her. Then, in the same way, we heard more of the two themes about which, in her messages, she has spoken most frequently. They are love your neighbour and forgiveness and reconciliation. The prayers which followed included the prayer of St Francis of Assisi, which starts, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace, and in its scope fully embraces the Queen's life. It was a very moving service, which ended with the following words. Six months before her coronation, Elizabeth asked the people of the United Kingdom and Commonwealth to pray that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making, and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. God, it is clear, has answered those prayers, and we owe him and her enormous gratitude. A glorious jubilee, your majesty. Enborn and the Platinum Jubilee by John King At the centre of Enborn's celebrations was Sunday's sung Eucharist. Today is Whit Sunday, so the service combined commemoration of that feast with thanks to the Queen. The Reverend Tom Moffat led a moving service which we all appreciated. The hymns chosen by Tom and Julian included hymns suitable for both occasions, including Immortal Invisible, sung at St Paul's on Thursday. In his sermon, Tom reminded us of the moving words of the Archbishop, once Bishop of Reading, in which he placed the Queen's remarkable years of service at the centre of a truly Christian life. Tom also quoted the words of the Vicar of Newbury in this week's Newbury Weekly News. We all left church spiritually refreshed, imbued with the spirit of the Platinum Jubilee. There were private parties to mark the occasion. Ros, who shares a birthday with the Queen, was at a dinner party on Thursday. Foxgrove, which is always at the heart of Emborn celebrations, held a tea party on Saturday at which flags and bunting were much in evidence. Whilst on Sunday, Margaret, who had been celebrating two days before on Exmoor, attended the Andover Drove Tea Party. Margaret and Anna joined in the Hampstead Marshall celebrations on Sunday afternoon at the White Hart. I spent much of the Jubilee reading a remarkable book. It is called Tales of a Country Parish, written by Colin Heber Percy, who is a vicar of Savernac. The title does not do justice to the book. It is much more than the tales of a country parish. It is a theological and philosophical insight into the Christian faith, a study of natural life of the Savernac region, and an introduction to some wise country folk. The Jubilee in Kintbury by Alison Hartwright. What a fabulous community Jubilee weekend! Apart from the amazing events on television we were able to see, many still recorded, no doubt, like ourselves, looking forward to watching in quieter moments in coming days. Our own village did so well with community events. A fantastic result for the open garden, both on a social and financial level. Thank you, Robert and Jill, for the loan of your beautiful garden. Followed by a good opportunity on Saturday with the Christians in Kintbury store to link with the village in, appropriately, the Jubilee Centre grounds about all our various Christian events. A massive thank you to Jill, Alice, Lynn and Samuel for stepping in. So sorry the Maxton Livesey family were not able to attend, having made the original plans and arrangements. Then, to finish on Sunday with two excellent services. Jenny's outside Pentecost service, complete with burning brazier, followed by Patrick's Jubilee service. Inside, with the beautiful flowers by our wonderful flower ladies. 
Patrick's sermon reminded us of the three S words linked to the Queen, which I thought was slightly spooky, inasmuch as we had all been singing You Are My Sunshine at Prayers and Bears on Thursday, as they were Patrick's closing words, that the Queen had been our sunshine over the years during tough times. Olivia's Queen card activity was a huge hit. Thank you so much for thinking about the children. Two little boys and their father were covered in tiny gold stars all morning, on their faces, not just the cards. A real hit. And finally, bubbles to toast the Queen and canapes afterwards outside. Thank you, Tom, for the Land Rover and muscle power in arranging tables, bottles, etc. And Millie for her delicious canapes. Clive and I both felt so lucky to belong to the Kimbrey congregation and community to share in the once-in-a-lifetime Jubilee event. More pictures of the Jubilee in the Benefice will shortly be put on the gallery pages of the Kintbury and Inkpen, a church near you, sites. Kintbury, https colon forward slash forward slash www dot a church near you dot com forward slash church forward slash one six eight forward slash ink pen https colon forward slash forward slash www dot a church near you dot com forward slash church forward slash five nine zero seven forward slash news from Enborne School by Katie Wallace Enborn C of E Primary School have been busy this term. Jubilee celebrations in the playground, welcoming Ukrainian families joining us, trips in our minibus, Oliver production at the Arlington Arts, trip to London coming soon, and of course SATS exams. We aim for a healthy mix of curriculum work and extra activities for all to enjoy, and more to come. We would like to invite people with an interest in education, community or finance to join our thriving school and become a member of our proactive governing board. For more information, contact Alan Powell on apowell at nborn.w-barks.sch.uk In Search of a Happy Ending by Tessa Locke Researching local history particularly the lives of local people, is a fascinating and absorbing pastime. And watching events unfold through the various online archives sometimes seems like watching a period drama reveal itself. Happy endings, or at least satisfactory conclusions, are perhaps the most rewarding, but quite often the archives will reveal tantalising extracts of a story, the conclusion of which remains a mystery. For example... The Kentish Weekly Post of 22nd of December 1731 has the earliest reference to Kintbury I can find, in its report of the barbarous and cruel murder of Thomas Wilde, as he returned from his business, officiating in the excise, to his residence at Kintbury. He was apparently attacked and robbed by two footpads of his money, horse, greatcoat and boots, and was cut bruised and beat, in so barbarous and cruel a manner that he died on the twelfth of the said month. The next chapter in this murder mystery is lost to the annals of time, or at least the newspaper archives, and whether the gracious pardon offered by His Majesty to whichever accomplice chose to turn King's evidence against his partner in crime had any effect in solving the case, it is not known. Then, there is the story of one Reverend Daniel Orr, sometime curate of Hampstead Marshall. In 1881, the Reverend Daniel Orr, aged 39, is living with his wife Caroline, 36, and four children at Redhill, Hampstead Marshall. Daniel had been born in Ireland, and although his wife came from Lewisham in Kent, the couple had been married there in County Kerry. Their eldest child, Edith, had been born in Ireland, but their next child, William, five, had been born at Stone in Buckinghamshire, which suggests the family had been settled in England for no more than about six years. 
quite how or why this young Irishman had come to be a curate in a rural Berkshire parish, we do not know. Perhaps because there would have been more opportunities for an Anglican priest in England than in the predominantly Catholic era. The Orr family were not to stay in Berkshire for long, however. On the 14th February 1884, a paragraph in the Newbury Weekly News is headed Removal of the Reverend D. Orr. The text then goes on to explain that the previous Sunday had been Reverend Orr's last as curate and that he had entered into an explanation of the circumstances which had led to his removal and concluded by expressing his gratitude for the great kindness which he had received from various friends among the parishioners and others in the neighbourhood. Unfortunately for us, the Newbury Weekly's correspondent did not see fit to explain the circumstances of the Reverend Orr's removal to his readers, and nearly 200 years later we can only wonder what he had done or what circumstances had changed to cause him to leave the church. Removal seems a very harsh word and suggests to me that he had been asked to leave although the fact that he had, apparently, received support from his parishioners indicates that, in the eyes of his parishioners, he had done nothing wrong. It has been almost impossible to find out anything else of Daniel's story, except that a family tree made publicly available on Ancestry indicates that Daniel not only left Hampstead Marshall, but then England, and eventually Europe as well. When he died in 1931, he was living in Maine, USA. Perhaps somewhere in the archives of St Mary's, Hampstead Marshall, will be a record of why the young Irish curate had to leave. But without that information, the full story of Daniel Orr must remain unknown. The Newby Weekly News item I would really like to know much more about appears in an edition of November 1919. Back then, news from the surrounding area was printed in columns under the name of the particular village, very much as in most regional newspapers until recently. What differed then was that news items were frequently followed by a paragraph or two submitted by local businesses to advertise, for example, new stock being available in shops. However, it seems that one Kinchbury resident was so upset by his fellow villagers that the following statement had been submitted to be printed under that week's Kinchbury News. A young man of the village would be much obliged if certain Kinchbury people would mind their own business. If they do not, steps will be taken. If some of the kind people of Kinchbury would mind their own business rather than look after other people's, it would be much more to their own credit and to prove what they say is the truth. E.E.P. Did the people of Kintbury subsequently mind their own business? Did E.E.P. have to take further steps? What, in fact, had rattled him in the first place that he had to express his feelings via the Newbury Weekly News? We shall never know. Walbury Beacon Benefice Contact Details Jenny Veazey Email jennyveasy at hotmail.com Benefice Office 01635 226 064 Email wbboffice at gmail.com Items for the beacon to fill on pji at crestednewcomputing.co.uk Services in Warby Beacon Benefice for June 2022. All services are dependent on ministry availability. To check for changes, please always check the weekly benefice email if you are on the circulation list. To add your name, contact Alex on wbboffice at gmail.com. Look on the website https colon forward slash forward slash www.walburybeaconbenefice.org.uk forward slash or a church near you https colon forward slash forward slash www.achurchnearyou.com for up-to-date information confirmation of service times and location
In order to protect more vulnerable parishioners, we would appreciate those attending services in all our churches to continue to practice hand sanitising, wearing of face masks and respect for those who wish to maintain social distancing. Sunday, 5th of June. Kintbury, Pentecost Praise for the Jubilee, 10am. Platinum Jubilee Service, 11am. Enborn, Holy Communion, 9.45am. Inkpen, Platinum Celebration for the Queen, 9.45am. Sunday, 12th of June. West Woody, Holy Communion, 11.15am. Inkpen, Holy Communion, 9.15am. Kintbury, Holy Communion, 8am. Sunday, 19th of June. Enborn, Matins, 9.45am. Kintbury, Morning Praise, 9.45am. Coombe, Holy Communion, 11.15am. Inkpen, Compline, 6pm. Sunday, 26th of June. West Woody, Compline, 6pm. Kintbury, Holy Communion, 9.45am.